Good evening, everybody. This is the College of Complexes. If you, we have Howard Court with us, and Howard will be telling us something about how to end. Okay, the, uh, chicken or ministry? Or at least one way to end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict uh, with a one-state solution. Not necessarily so, uh, but. We will discuss it, and we will find out the various details that we should be attending to. Harold Court. Yay! Yeah. Harold has spoken here before. Uh, oh, you're welcome, sweetheart. Much to know us. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I was here two or three years ago in general location. Yes. A lot has changed in the world since then. Um, but I'll tell you what I'm going to do tonight. Uh, I'm going to talk about how I got into this field, and it's quite a story. And I got these books here. I know several of the people who wrote them, and I'm going to mention them. But I'm not selling them. So Can you use the mic? The reason I'm not selling them is I'm hoping this fall to go to Haifa University, which is in the northern part of Israel, and, it, uh, and donate these books and try to encourage them to develop a department of coexistence. And Haifa and Haifa University has the largest percentage of minorities of any other university, of the six universities in Israel. So, uh, there's about 25% Palestinian, both in, in the university and the city. But there's a map up there, I have to apologize. I had a big one and I couldn't find it. So this afternoon, very quickly, I wrote it there. I know some people might possibly be offended, but it, it really, I did it fast, but at least we know where Syria Lebanon, Jordan, the Galilee, the Negev, and all these various places, if we need to point them out. But I also want, first, before starting, I want to, what's the name of the, the other internet other than Twitter? Facebook. Facebook. Yeah, Facebook. Okay, pardon me. And in Facebook, this morning, I came across a real small little thing, a notice from Israel. This, on April 30th, there's going to be a meeting in Tel Aviv at the corner of Rothschild and Schenken Street, an Israeli-Palestinian Congress of People. Uh, it's two peoples together solving the problems of the conflict. That's a good sign. Anyway, what I'm going to do tonight is, uh, because I, the two-state solution, I think, is just about dead, and even if it's not dead, it's close to it, I think now we've got to turn and, and uh, begin thinking, what's the next thing to do uh, if we're going to solve this problem? So I came up with five different solutions that different people have proposed. And most of them are represented in these books. Maybe I'll hold them up as I come across them. But I don't have the answers. I do have one. At the end of this, I'm going to make a suggestion, my tentative plan. It's based upon studying all these others. Just uh, an idea I'll throw out. But before doing that, uh, you know, just to remind everybody, Secretary Kerry made a a real try at diplomacy recently, and it didn't work. Whatever the reasons were, you could blame both sides, but it didn't work, and it hasn't worked for over a decade. And so the question is, you know, I came across a quote from Einstein. Einstein... I, my wording might not be perfect, but Einstein said, 
if you keep on doing the same thing that failed, it's stupidity. And after a certain point, I want to mention one other person, and this is a guy who was my mentor at Antioch College. It was Arthur Morgan, who was the first chairman of the Tennessee Valley Authority, the TVA. Uh, he was an elderly man when I knew him, but I knew him well, and the main thing that I learned from him was when you're making important decisions, look at all the options, look at all the alternatives, don't jump in. And that's been my guiding principle ever since, and why I got into this business here. Um, because I graduated from Antioch in 1956, and, um, uh, well, something happened. In 1954, I, uh, I went to a work camp. It was through the American Friends Service Committee uh, in connection with some European uh, groups. And I met these guys from Sweden in Austria. We went down to Yugoslavia and helped them build a dam in northern Croatia. Um, and it was called the Internacional na Brigada, the International Brigade. So it was a really great thing, and I was supposed to go from there to another camp in Austria. But there was a Swedish gal in the camp who, just, who knew, had friends in Israel, and she says, I'm going down to Israel. So I liked her, that was part of the reason, but uh, so I, I, I um, sent a telegram to the service committee and I said, I want to go to Israel, I want to change. And they said, well, okay, go ahead. So we went over to um, Rieka and we got on a freighter. It took us about 10 days carrying wood down to Israel. Uh, and then Israel sends fruit back. But anyway, that's how I got there. I didn't, I wasn't part of any tour. I just was on my own. First I went to the kibbutz where she had friends. One of the things that happened there, I was working in the field and there was a black guy working there. So I looked at him and I said, what, what are you doing here? He said to me, what are you doing here? So anyway, the, there were uh, three Americans at that, at that kibbutz and they had a, a house out in the field away from the rest of them. I hear that people visited them at night for whatever reason, I don't know. But that's what I've heard. They were pretty lucky guys. Anyway, after spending a few days there, I then traveled around the country. I didn't have any real idea of what the Arab or the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict was at that point. But when I came home, uh, I was still at Antioch College. Arthur Morgan said, well, Howard, I was called Howie at that time. He said, Howie, just write it, think it through and write up something about your trip. And that's all. It was a, you know, a, a credit course. So I began to write on it, and I, then I began to study it more. And then I graduated in 1956. And that was the year, in fact, I was working on a farm in uh, Vermont. And then one night we hear Israel, France, and England have invaded Egypt. And I wasn't too keen about that uh, because I believe in nonviolence. And as a matter of fact, Ike Eisenhower was either. He stopped them. So, that was really the second major encounter I had on this business. Uh, and then after that, I remember the 67 war. And I knew, I was in, Cle I was back in Cleveland where I grew up. There's a big Syrian population there. Um, and I knew somebody and I really, they, they were, they were collecting money for relief for refugees from that war because it was very devastating and I helped them for a day or two. 
But anyway, um, I kept studying about this. I worked for the New York State Department of Labor for over 30 years. When I retired in 96, I began really focusing on this. And I remembered what I learned from Arthur Morgan, namely an important issue, look at all the options. So I began to, to do that. And especially in the year 2000, I came across an article um, in De Daedalus magazine about different types of um, binational uh, solutions. And I, I knew some others that they didn't even mention. So I said, you know, it might be good to form um, a booklet or a book of all the different options. And so we could look at them or the, uh, the negotiators and then before making decisions. So I began working on that. And in 2008, I, uh, I published, uh, it's on the internet, it's not an official publication, but you can get it on the internet just by going to my name, Howard Court, or else going to approaches to coexistence.com. Um, and it was just 12 pages, single space, but it went into, I found that there were dozens of proposals from people in maybe a dozen countries, in Europe, in this country, Israel, Palestine, maybe even one from Malaysia, which is another country that, in which there are two or three ethnic groups involved. So, and then, uh, Shortly after that, I went to Israel again, um, but I got sick when I was there. So uh, I was in a hospital, and a Palestinian guy kept uh, visiting me, bringing me sweet rolls and stuff like that. And uh, I just, when coming back, my sister here in Chicago said, Howard, why don't you come direct to Chicago? Well. I was living in an old colonial house run down in the outskirts of Albany and I decided to do it because I was a widower and my, I knew my sister well so I came. I'm really glad I did because it's been a great uh, about eight, nine years since I've been here. And a couple of, and, um, a couple of years ago, I spoke to a group here about um, these different options. Tonight, I'm not going to go as widely as I did then with all these various plans. Some of them not very good, some of them not well thought out, some very well thought out. Um, but I'm, what I'm going to focus on is just five different approaches that are now more or less in the pipeline. Um, say, I wanted to, I got the five of them listed here. Uh, so you can follow it. Do you want to, somebody want to pass these out? And I've also got my- I'll well, do it. From. I've also got my uh, business card. So why don't you just both, take both of those? Give him half, maybe. <laughs> what? I'll just start him around. What did that pig ever do? That, that um, my card indicates, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the article I wrote, and also I sort of formed an organization, I never got it official, but it was called PACO, which is Esperanto for Peace, 
and uh, Political Approaches to Coexistence, that's what it stands for. And I've uh, been using that name, in fact I signed most of my letters saying Paco, and then I put parentheses, peace in Esperanto. But anyway, um, so I felt it was about time that I should really get down and write something again. And thank you for, I'm glad you, this group is in existence. It gave me a chance to focus. Um, and it's, I want to mention one other thing. In, in, when I, um, in 2009, or after I'd already been here in Chicago, I went again and um, there was a thing called the Israel-Palestine, um, I think a committee for research and information. And I ran, uh, led a workshop there. There were people from both groups. And it was very good. I, I really enjoyed doing that. But I, I haven't done much like that. Well, one other time at the um, uh, Lincoln Park Village, which is a community organization down around uh, uh, Lakeview and Lincoln Park. I spoke to the men's group, but this, your group gave me a chance to really focus, and it wasn't so easy to do that, but I have about several copies of a paper that I wrote, which I'm going to go, and afterward I can give a few of them out to those who are really interested. But anyway, um, you know, some people are insisting that we go back to the two-state solution. And uh, it, it, it's uncanny to me how they do that. They think that's all there is. But there are other things. Why don't we look at some of the others also? You don't have to forget the two-state solution, but look at the others. Okay, I'll start. Uh, there's this organization that I mentioned that I spoke to in 2009. It changed its name. It's still IPCRI. They call it the Israel-Palestine Creative Regional In Initiatives. And the basic point they make is that residence and citizenship don't have to be synonymous. And you know, Israel is is so afraid of um, being overrun in, in, by a majority of Palestinians. It'd be possible for Israel to have more Palestinians in their country, but as residents, they vote on local matters just like anybody else, but their national citizenship would be Palestinian, and they vote on with Palestinian issues nationally, the same way the settlers in the West Bank, uh, Israeli settlers would keep, and they do more or less, they do have Israeli citizenship now, but this would be part of a plan. They would keep their um, Israeli citizenship, but on local matters, they would have to negotiate with uh, Palestinians and they could vote on local issues, zoning and so on. Um, now, I also uh, wrote a, a sort of a variation on that. I had an idea, and this is probably impractical, but anyway, in the, along the line of trying to look at a lot of things, I had an idea that if you divided the country into about 200 districts, about 100 Palestinian and 100 Israeli, and that means both the West Bank, Gaza, and Israel, into equal areas of about 50,000 persons each, a, lo a lot of those um, local groups, uh, uh, local populations would work out to be either one or the other. If you made some adjustments to the boundaries and maybe some transfers of population, it might be possible to actually do that. So you'd have a hundred local places that had a Palestinian majority 
and 100 in Israeli. And, but in terms of citizenship, within those places, beyond being a minority uh, with the other group, the majority, you could have more of your group, but the rest of them would be residents, not citizens. Anyway, that's something that I, I was looking, and I, somebody uh, complimented me on it, but there'd be an awful lot of work that would have to be done to accomplish it. But anyway, it's under the basic concept of, of um, dissociating residency and citizenship. So that's one approach. There's another approach that's uh, really very, I don't happen to have an exact book on that first one, but on this second one, this book here, One Land, Two States, it's, it was written by a guy from the University of California and a Swede, Mossberg, from Stockholm. And the uh, writers in it are from, all, from both this country, Israel, and Palestine. The, the basic idea there is that you would have two states on the entire country. You'd probably have two parliaments that might even be next to each other in Jerusalem. But on, on certain issues, it would have to be done jointly. You'd have to, for instance, sanitation or uh, traffic regulations and probably foreign affairs would have to be agreed upon. But most everything else could be done separately religion, education, um, a whole host of other things. In fact, another group, not the same, but another group, uh, a Palestinian group who looked at this, said that they thought all the internal affairs, such as education, culture, religion, language, media, way of life, etc., could be separate, and yet there'd be no boundaries in the country. You'd have two different states. They both could send ambassadors to other countries. Um, and there'd be no boundaries. You'd probably have to take down the wall and do something with the bricks. I don't know what. But, I mean, that, that book is a really very comprehensive book. And as a matter of fact, here's something that's going to surprise you. According to uh, El Monitor, which is one of the leading publications, Channel 2 News in Israel, Yudi Siegel, subsequently reported on a staff work commissioned by Netanyahu. He asked the staff to examine the governmental arrangements in the Barrow Nassau and Barrow Hertog communities on the Belgian Dutch border jointly run by the two governments, which constitute a smaller example of parallel states. Um, I was really surprised. You know, it shows some flexibility. At least he's interested to find out about it, thank God. Now, there have been some places in the world where something like this has been tried. For instance, the New Hebrides Islands in the Pacific was run by jointly by England and France. Nothing as extensive as they're proposing here, but it's a, I, I can't believe that there aren't people thinking about it now, and seriously. But okay, that's, that's the second one. Um, another idea that's now circulating, and you see it on your list, is the third item is um, one person, one vote, one state. Um, that is a higher percentage of Palestinians than Israelis are for that, but there are some Israelis who are. And the first major book that came out on this by Virginia Tilly, who I don't think 
is either an Israeli or a Jew or an Arab. But as a matter of fact, she also went to Antioch College and I communicated with her. It's a very thorough book on what a one state would be. Um, and then other people, like Ali Abu Nima here in Chicago wrote One Country. Uh, there is a movement, and they periodically meet in different cities in the world. There was one that I was going to go to, I didn't end up going, it was in Munich, Germany, a couple years ago. And they came up with the One State Declaration. That would be one person, one vote. Um, now, of course, to many Israelis, they fear this because, the, well, you know, the Arab population is high, but I've been hearing that it now is going down and the Jewish birth rate is going up. But even beyond that, I think it would be possible to decentralize many of the functions, just like an earlier plan that I mentioned, so that even though you'd have one state, you could have a high degree of centralization or relative autonomy for both people under one state. Now, of course, it wouldn't give Israel the ironclad security that it wants, but it would give it a lot. And the UN would sanction it, the people of the world would be for it, um, but it's a controversial issue. Uh, and then, of course, there are other people who, some of the Israelis are just hoping that eventually they'll just be able to end up taking over the West Bank and uh, make it one state in Israel. And in fact, I guess, there's a woman called Carolyn Glick, who's a Chicagoan, as a matter of fact. But now she's one of the leading correspondents for the Jerusalem Post. She wrote a book called The Israeli Solution, a one-state plan for peace in the Middle East. But her proposal, it, it, it says, let's give the Palestinians Israeli citizenship, but let's cut Gaza adrift doesn't want to take in Gaza. Now the question is, does Egypt want to take Gaza? Unlikely. A Gaza now is a, a country destroyed in many ways, plus most of the population were refugees from the 48 war, and now they're even worse off. So Israel, according to this plan, Israel would get rid of Gaza, and then they, well, that would ensure Israeli majority ship, and they're willing to give full citizenship, they say, to Palestinians. But to me, that that isn't an adequate solution. The Gaza is almost two million people, and they're some of the most needy people in the world. I think we've got to figure out what's going to happen to Gaza, and could Gaza be brought in also, and yet have certain governmental regulations and constitutional uh, items that would prevent a majority ruling badly to on a minority. I think we could figure out rules and way that no matter which side was the majority, that they be protected and you make them all citizens. Right now, uh, the only real citizens in the whole area are the Jewish Israelis. And as a matter of fact, it's even more than that, it's the Ashkenazi Jews uh, or Israeli, the, the European Jews. The Sephardic Jews from the Middle East countries in many ways consider themselves second class citizens. Not as much second class as the Palestinians, but less than the Western European, the European Jews. Uh, and then you have the Palestinians in the West Bank, and they're even a lower degree. They don't have citizenship at all. And some people in Jerusalem, well, even worse, they have no citizenship. 
And of course, you know, everybody's vying for it, but I think you could have Jerusalem, and some of these plans do have Jerusalem and a little bit surrounding area having its own legislature or two legislatures. Uh, the East, East Jerusalem being Palestinian and West Israeli. Uh, it'd be a shame to turn that into a monolith of either side. I mean, Jerusalem, I think, should be the, the city that sets an example. Right now, it certainly isn't. But anyway, one person, one vote is uh, on the horizon. A lot of, you know, it's a growing movement, slowly but growing. But there are a lot of questions about it. But okay, going on beyond that. Um, I already mentioned Carolyn Glick, a Chicagoan. I think she grew up around this neighborhood. But here's another Chicagoan, Ali Azunima. I don't know if any of you ever heard of him. He's from. Uh, he was connected to the University of Chicago. He still lives there, but he's traveling most of the time. I know him pretty well. He's an extremely, I would say he's about the most articulate Palestinian American on the scene, maybe anywhere. And his father used to be an ambassador. But anyway, they, they left the whole family at the time of the 48 war. But he's written two books. The first book was One Country, which was uh, another book on the idea of one state and one person, one vote. And then he just came out uh, about a year ago, a book called The Battle for Justice in Palestine. Um, and I would say the central point that he's making or then was that the Palestinians should not strive necessarily for sovereignty. There are other things that they really should strive for more important than that. Um, I'm going to quote from him. Uh, he, he heralds the agenda of the widely endorsed 2005 Palestinian call for BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Um, which demands that Israel recognize the Palestinian people's inalienable right to self-determination and uphold international law by ending its occupation and colonization of all Arab lands, dismantling the apartheid wall in the West Bank, recognizing the fundamental rights of the Arab and Palestinian citizens of present-day Israel to full equality and respecting, protecting, and promoting the rights of Palestinian refugees to return to their homes and properties as stimulated in U as stipulated in Re UN Resolution 194. Well, that book uh, has been heralded. It's, um, there's a lot of meat to this and the things you can disagree with or agree with, but it's very thoughtful, and um, as a matter of fact, I wrote an article, a book review of this, which appeared in Tikkun, uh, the online journal uh, for Tikkun Magazine. Have you ever heard of Tikkun Magazine? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. It's a, a journal whose Tikkun in Hebrew means um, resolving the world or fixing the world, repairing the world. And Michael Lerner, uh, who started that, uh, he's the guy who wrote it. Anyway, they published a, a, a review that I wrote. And in my review, I made the idea, the idea, how about the Jewish people also attempting self-determination? And the two peoples together determining the country. That would mean, on the Jewish side, you'd have to end the discrimination against Arabs and against Sephardi Jews. And they're paying the, um, the income disparity. The income disparity in Israel 
is about as bad as it is here in this country. And that's in a small country. Uh, and it didn't used to be that way, but it is now. So the self-determination for Jews, for Israelis, I think would involve working on ending that income disparity, as well as discrimination. And if the two peoples could both develop self-determination and then do it in unison, what a great thing that would be. But I haven't heard comments on that yet. I'd like to hear them. Anyway, um, I mentioned Michael Lerner from the Coon Magazine. This is his recent book, uh, Embracing Israel-Palestine. I, I know him pretty well, too. He's indefatigable in trying to figure ways of looking at both sides, um, understanding the Nakba and the great harm that was done to three-quarters of a million Palestinians in 1948. And he also, of course, is very cognizant of what happened in Europe and the plight of people from Europe and how they were desperate when they came to Israel. And throughout the book, he's trying to see both sides and hope to encourage both sides to see the other. Um, there's another guy. by the name of Mazum Kumsia. I know him too. He spoke in Chicago, and we subsequently corresponded. He, he spent about 25 years in this country teaching at Duke and Yale in genetics, and then he moved back. Now he's back in his village in the West Bank, and he teaches at Birzeit University, and I think maybe the other Palestinian University, but he wrote a book several years ago called Sharing the Land of Canaan, Human Rights and the Israeli-Palestinian Struggle, but it's in the mood, in the direction of trying to see both sides and see human rights for everybody. And Mazim is the most determined, indefatigable person I've ever seen in my life. He traveled all over this country before he left on a bus talking about it. He's now building the first uh, museum of natural history in Palestine. He's the guy in charge of that. Uh, so, I mean, there's a lot of high quality people on both sides that have been working on this. Well, then I'm going to get to the final one, Arab-Jewish partnerships. I shouldn't have put them so far over. This is a very small little book that just came out. It's called Ending the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict. The man who wrote it is called Landrum Bowling. He used to be president of Irwin College in Indiana, and he, for, he founded the Mercy Foundation that helps distressed people throughout the world. And he spent over 40 years working on the Arab-Israeli conflict. He's now 101 years old. He was 100 when he published this. Uh, but he's still keen, and it, it, this summarizes those, he's got about seven points at the end of that book. It's not very expensive. I hope some of you get it. Anyways, um, his final point of the seven, the Israeli and Palestinian political, religious, and educational leaders should make joint public declarations of their commitment to the building of permanent peace through appropriate Arab-Jewish partnerships of individuals and organizations in both societies. Now it sounds, in a way, you could say, well, that doesn't mean anything, but I think it does. 
I mean, this is a sum of his. He knew Rabin, I think, Golda Meir, a lot of other very prominent people. He was a very prominent guy, but th that's what he's concluding. But he isn't the only one. There are lots of examples on the local level of the two people working together. Um, I think this is the last book I'm going to get. There's a guy by the name of Daniel Gavron. He's an English Jew who settled in Palestine. I corresponded with him too. He's got a book called Holy Land Mosaic, stories of cooperation and coexistence between Israelis and Palestinians. And there are lots of them. There's a place called Neve Shalom, which is a, a joint community. Both kids learn all three languages, English, Arabic, and Hebrew. The, it's a total cooperative community, and it's been so for quite a few years. Uh, also, other people, uh, the Jerusalem-based Interfaith Encounter Association has been working on this. And there are others. Anyway, all right, just, I'm coming to what I want to suggest now. First of all, I think if there can be an increase, an acceleration of Arab-Jewish partnerships, there might come a point when a sufficient amount of public opinion could lead toward an interest in one of those solutions or something else. There are others. But here's what I want to suggest. What if somebody of some prominence suggested that a representative or two of each of these different approaches met and had a, a conference or had a meeting in which they compared notes. You know, if that could be done skillfully, I think some of these people might compromise. They might try to come up with the best solution because they all have been trying it and they haven't succeeded. And they spent lots of money, time, and tears. So that's what I'm suggesting, and I've been writing different people about it. I've gotten a little bit in the Cleveland Plain Dealer, and also a little smaller one in the Tribune with this general idea. But I don't know. Maybe you guys will, and gals will think it's just totally unrealistic. But. I don't think any of these solutions are ironclad. And I think if they could get together and compare notes and see what they agreed upon and what they don't, then maybe you could come up with a composite that, that, would, that might be a start toward doing the trick. So that's what I want to leave you with. Uh, one other thing. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I guess I apologize for the inexactness of the map and also of the presentation, but uh, I've been working, this has been my key endeavor for at least 15 years since I uh, retired from the Labor Department, and even before that. And I'm going to, as long as I have help, I'm probably about the oldest guy here, um, but I'm going to keep going. And I have offered to Haifa University my library, because I met uh, Amos Shapiro, Shapira, who's the president, he used to be the CEO from LL Airlines, but Haifa was university, they needed a business type and they hired him, and he's trying to, to uh, you know, do that. Haifa University has about 20,000 students. Um, it's not the largest university there, but it's a significant one. And they have a couple sociologists, in fact, Palestinians, who have been working on this and have been saying stuff somewhat similar to me. So if I get over there this fall, the, the, their representative here in Chicago broke her ankle. But when that meant that she's going to, uh, the president asked her to help me arrange to go over and talk over this. Now, 
you know, shipping my books, how much would that cost? I don't know. But maybe they would form a local unit here, and then they could get their own copies over there. I don't know what could happen, but I think Haifa is a particular place it's a large city of about 300, 400,000, but it's uh, not huge. And it has the best history of Arab-Jewish cooperation. Not perfect, but better. So I think that, the, and they have a department now called Conflict Management, but I'd like them to change it and make it coexistence. And that's what I'm gonna try and do. Uh, so if you have any ideas on this, and any arguments against the things I've been saying, I'd like to hear them. Thank you. All right. Second question. Uh, Howard has been standing for some time, and I figure that uh, to respond to your questions, uh, maybe we should remove this uh, yeah, yeah, let him uh, answer from a seated position. Yeah. Uh, would you help with that? Uh, I have, I have uh, trouble with my legs, so it would be good. Thank you. Okay. You know, uh, I, go ahead. All right. Well, if nobody else has a question. I, got I, have, a question. I have one. All right. Okay. All right, Mike, first of all, uh, could, could, uh, I wonder, yeah. you, you make a better door than a window, Brom. Yeah. Um, okay, I, um, my question for our speaker is sort of a two-part question. First of all, do you support uh, negotiation, uh, do you support um, negotiation between the Israeli, look, I, I came in late, do you, um, if the Israeli government was to negotiate with the Palestinians, I mean, who would they, who specifically would they negotiate with? Well, there's a Palestinian authority, mm -hmm. but that authority does not encompass the interests of those Palestinians living in Israel, which are a million and a quarter, or doesn't incorporate the interests of the Palestinian refugees, that, including 80,000 of them who are here in Chicago and others in throughout Europe and South America and Chile, so that's one of the problems. The Palestinian Authority, you know, even if it was perfect, it couldn't represent all of them. I don't know. I think you, you, we need to get representatives of these different, and Jewish representatives too. I think that the American Jewish community should have something to say. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, the when you get the American Jewish community is not as right wing now as the Israeli is. So it might, my personal opinion is that the Israeli uh, government right now is far to the right. So we try to get representatives of different factions. And even though the Jewish community is a diaspora in the rest of the world, they have a deep interest in Israel. I think they should have some say. Uh, to have Netanyahu say that he's the representative of the Jews of the world, I think is proper. And also, we need to get representatives of, of the Palestinians who are elsewhere. I think the Jews and the Palestinians are about the two most dispersed people in the world, one of the two. <coughs> Yes. Uh, the yeah. Um, you still have not talked about the problem. In between the Jordan River and the sea, there are thousands of lunatics passionately committed to mass murder. What is going to change their mind? They're not lunatics. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure I agree with you on that. Hamas, Hezbollah. <coughs> The coup, the so-called price taggers. There are extremists there, there's no question. But how much do they represent really? I don't know. They, you know, one extremist can ruin everything sometimes. 
but I think that they're a minority, and I think both peoples have to figure a way to prevent their influence and allow the influence of the majority of people. The Israeli people now are reeked with high inflation, high costs, lower salaries, and part of it is because so damn much money is going into armaments. And that's one part of the whole thing. And the Palestinians are, but you know something, according to what I have heard, the Palestinians had an election, and Hamas scored high in it, and we prevented that from being actualized. Now the question is, was that right? There are signs that Hamas, there are indications that Hamas could compromise if a real solution came forward. And taking their representative nation away from them certainly wasn't a way to make them more conciliatory. <laughs> it doesn't matter if there are only a few hundred mass murderers that stops everything, as we have seen. How do we convince the, convict, the, the, the passionate, dedicated killers to give up on it? I think they've got to see their own life improve a little bit. I think, I think that's, they're desperate, and some of those people, you know, what, have you ever been unemployed for long periods, and how boring it is, and what you do for your, I mean, in addition to being deprived of material things, it's a problem to be unemployed. And right now, the percentage of unemployed is so high, particularly among young men, that I think after a while they get desperate. That leads into my second question. The entire Arab world has been abusing the Palestinians like asswipe for nearly a century. Just last week, the Palestinian refugee camps in Syria were overrun in the, in the wars of, of, of the collapse of Syria. Why, after 70 years, are these people still imprisoned in camps? How are you going to get the Arab world to actually treat the Palestinians with any decency? They never have. It's really to treat them with decency. There's a lot of aspects to that, but one, uh, the Palestinians were deeply connected to the land, more than the Jews were to their lands in Europe. They were, they were centuries old connected there. And they want to go back, to, if not to their homes, at least to the areas. And it means, and they pass it on from one generation to the next. They don't want to assimilate. Some do, yes. Some do, but some don't. They want to go back, at least generally, to that area. And if Israel and Palestine could work together so that some would go to Palestine and some would go to Israel, and some would just get monetary compensation. Maybe we could solve that and, and bring justice to people who are, it's not just the other countries that don't want to take them. They don't, a lot of them don't want to assimilate. They want to go back. They, they teach their kids about what it was like back there. Okay, Jan um, I was just curious when you said there was so much inflation and unemployment. Uh, what happens to all that money that the United States gives Israel? You know, I understand they get a blank check every year. What do they do with it? Well, obviously, the biggest, a big part of Israel's budget is military. <laughs> they buy our old weapons, right? Well, if not directly, certainly indirectly. Um, there, there's a movement in Israel to say, let's not accept American money anymore. Uh, because they want to be independent. But, on the other hand, they're getting it, so most people want to keep getting what they can. But it doesn't trickle down. This isn't well, no, it doesn't. And uh, 
Of course, the United States also gives a considerable amount to the Palestinian Authority and to Egypt. Egypt is, I think, the second largest uh, container of American money. Israel is first. So we, you know, what, what's the name of that guy who's running for the Republicans who, who wants to limit our overseas engagement? Rand Paul. Rand Paul. Rand Paul. I think he might have something there. We are so involved, and we just, and you know, it's just endless, building up more army. We have 800 bases around the world. Israel is just in microcosm to what we are. So, at least that's my view. Thank you, Jen. Uh, Tim Bolter. I'd like to know what your thoughts are on a Gaza free trade zone. <laughs> what? The Gaza free trade zone. Much like Shenzhen in China, they opened up the borders and the markets to goods and trade. All of a sudden, they made that, that, that started exploding like crazy in the Chinese economy with these free trade zones. Why not what, do the what same thing? That mean in Gaza now is uh, ringed with uh, the Israeli military all around it. What and they can't fish very far into the ocean. What would this change be? What would it do? You basically make uh, the whole of Gaza Strip under their own control and make it a free trade zone where they can free goods freely. And they could open up the uh, borders with Egypt and uh, Israel and just, just let it go as a, as a free trade zone. Wouldn't yep. that solve the problems? I mean, they're, they're starting to talk to each other. You get a few little bit of goods. Is there anything wrong with that, uh, with that idea? Yes. Is like, there anything wrong with it? Yeah. I mean, I'd like you to comment. Well, there, you know, uh, to Israel, of course, is concerned with its security, and to just give them a free hand, you're not. Israel's not going to do that. And you know, maybe it could be negotiated in some way with regulations or with something to make sure that they wouldn't do what's not proper. But in general, the idea seems great. Singapore is a country, small country. Their leader just died. It's had such a success. You know, if these two people could work together, we truly would have a blossoming country. And the talent is so great among both. The Palestinians are the most talented of all Pal of Arabian, of Arabs. And the Jews are certainly talented. If they could work together, they could all blossom. But the concept has got to be there. And I think that a lot of the leaders, in particular, don't have that concept. Certainly the guy who is foreign affairs minister, and I think he's keeping the job, Lieberman, he certainly does not have that concept. He came from Moldavia, and I, the idea of joint pluralism is just out of his mind. Well, you have people like that in leadership, and it's not going to go forward. And the, the corruption that has been rampant in past years in the PLO. But there are examples. I mean, well, that's what we all have to do, is fight the, 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 the lazy people, or the mean people, or the dishonest people, and give examples of people who are doing it right. And if we get enough people doing that, we'll change it. And so that's what I'm trying to do. I hope some of you will. I'd like to get a group going here of both types. There is, there is a group called the Arab Jewish Partnership here that has, and it does some things. All right, I have a quick follow-up to that question. What do you think of Tipsy Livney? Is she hot or not? What is it? Zippy well, Lips. Zippy Lips, yeah. You, you, you know who I'm talking about, Don. Yes. I don't think she's a, a major figure. She's got a pretty good figure, but I don't <laughs> think she, uh, she didn't prove herself. And, and well, she's, a, a, you know, a politician who's vying right now for leadership. 
maybe she'll make it, maybe she won't, but she, I think she's a little bit more on the right side than Netanyahu is, from my point of view. Uh, can you tell us that there are maybe 25% uh, of the Haifa University are Palestinian, uh, Arab Palestinian. Uh, I wonder uh, there are, are other and larger <coughs> universities. Uh, what are the uh, universities that uh, cater to uh, Palestinians? Well, there's I think I think there's two Palestinian universities, Birzeit oh. and another one. I, I forget the name of it now, but uh, at least two. Um, but I'll give you an example of why Haifa University is more progressive than the others. Amos Shapiro told me that he recently arranged for holidays to be both Christian, Jewish, and Muslim. And the other universities don't have that. It's just Jewish holidays. That was quite a step ahead. Now, whether they'll be able, you know, maybe it's too much. But it, I, I hear the Baha'i would like a holiday also. But anyway, I'm kidding about that. But, um, you know, that was a step that they took in the Ivy University. And um, they had a, a conference there about three years ago on the one state solution. Can you believe that? I, I, I was amazed that Israel would allow a conference on the one state solution at Haifa. Of course, Israel probably felt it's innocuous, let them talk. But they, it was something. It was something. And, well, of course, that area was much higher percentage Palestinian originally, but it's still a million and a quarter in the Galilee, I mean, mostly in the Galilee. And um, I, this Amos Shapira, um, he was spoke here. I mean, I sense that the guy is trying to do the right thing. And he seems to, I send him my stuff, and he doesn't object to it. He still wants me to come. So, um, of course, I, if I go too far, it probably will ruin it. I, I, I've got to maintain the sense of balance. And where Israel is right, notice it. And you know, Israel, one of the things that Israel does now is talk about its technological advancement. And it is. Israel is tremendously technologically advanced now. But maybe some of the emphasis should be away from physical advancement and have it, what if Jewish minds were put on social integration and social advancement? All those Nobel Prize winners that the Jews have, have had, <coughs> In this country and there, I think it could make a tremendous. And as I say, the Palestinians are pretty darn talented themselves. So what, it, what we've got to do is work together to achieve this and not let the people who are, who are against that stuff win out. Let's do that. Let's, let's you know, we could encourage that here. Our congressman is, uh, what's her name? She's the congressman. Who is the congressman? Dan Shikowsky. Dan Shikowsky. Dan Shikowsky. Yeah, Dan. Jan isn't bad, but I think she could get better, and she could be a leader in this stuff, possibly, if her constituents encouraged her. I mean, uh, she's not, She. I think she shows some side of understanding to both sides. We've got to elect people like that. Okay. Uh, Daniela. Thank you. Thank you. Loud, please. Okay, I'll try. So I was raised in Israel in my school years. And one of the things I didn't really hear you explain is that the Jewish community is very important. 
cultures of the Palestinians and Israelis. So when you grow up in Israel, even as a little kid, you really are very militarized. You expect to go to the army whether you're a boy or a girl. And that mentality, which is very hypervigilant, is very prevalent, and a lot of it is aimed against the Arab states. That's one thing. And then the other thing is the extreme compression of the country. It's a very, very small country. And so when, when we talk about these cultures, they're really not separate. They're very intertwined. And so I think those tensions are very prevalent culturally. And they do really stand in the way of people's uh, transforming their own kind of mentality and rhetoric and ability to communicate. And I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Well, I, the best thing that I should mention is Neve Shalom. It's, uh, have you heard of that? I think it's southwest of Jerusalem. It's about 200 to 300 people, half and half. They live a totally integrated community, and all the kids learn all three languages, and so on, and it works. They keep asking for money, but like all these groups, we ask for money. So I have to make a decision. Do I help them or do I help somebody else? But there, it exists. And that, uh, that book that I mentioned, Holy Land Mosaic, Gavron has gone all through the country and written up example after example. We have to know about those things and not, not the, in addition to the terrorists. Uh, yes, uh, Dan White. Yeah, uh, Netanyahu came to Washington recently. I just wondered how. Could you stand up? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> the Prime Minister of Israel came to Washington and spoke to Congress. I mean, the politicians are. What would take? What would it take to change their minds? and their attitudes toward peace and war? Well, I think one thing is the American Jewish community and the American general community raised some questions about just automatically giving Israel money. That would make some difference. Or am I wrong on that? That's right. Yes. <coughs> How important was American money to you or in Israel? Very important. And of course, a lot, I think a lot of that is, from my point of view, is partly a reflection from the Holocaust. People in Europe want to do something to help the Jews. And you can understand it. But there comes a point where they've got to add to their concern in the Palestinians. <coughs> the, the, <coughs> is that an objection to what I'm saying? Yeah. No, I guess not. But the Nakba is the final stage of the Holocaust, I think. Oh, shit. Shit, yeah. Why don't you think it is? Wait, wait, wait. No, 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 no. This is, look, look, look at I, I question. I think I'm it is. Ask a question. Don Rich is All right. Uh, anxious to yeah, listen, I wanted to ask, um, what is, you mentioned Rabbi Michael Lerner. Um, what's, what's his view on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Well, he, he is emphasizing trying to understand both sides. Um, I know that he certainly wouldn't want to sell out Israel's interests. He's got a son serving in the IDF now. Oh, okay. But, but on the other hand, I think he'd be much more amenable to a certain percentage of refugees coming back under a, 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 a thought-out plan. I mean, you mean Palestinian refugees yes. coming to Israel? Is that what you mean by that? Yes, some percentage. And if not that, uh, some of them would accept money. And there's enough money in the world to do that. Other countries could help. What about some of the other countries that had a hand in the Holocaust? They could have a hand in trying to help compensate the Palestinians, too. It wouldn't have to come from one place. 
mentioned um, this idea of giving money to Palestinians to not come back, but almost everybody, at least in this country and in lots of other countries, is actually originally from someplace else. So what is the criteria you're going to have to say, okay, yes, we're going to pay you not to come back, because a lot of those people probably don't want to come back anyway. They're going to be lining up for money. And the second question, is, and the second part is, in, in the case of Israel, you've sort of glossed over their security concerns, but as a related matter, Israel is culturally rather paranoid because, and as was just mentioned, they're not attached to the land because for 2,000 years they've been kicked out of places and persecuted out of places. So you have to find some way to guarantee their security. Up right. until now, they have guaranteed their own. And I don't know whether you have a credible outside force to guarantee Israeli security. Well, it's got to be worked on. The UN can be part of it. They're not uh -oh. credible. Well, look at the Ukraine. It's got to be worked on. Yes, mm -hmm. Israel has to be guaranteed security. No question about it. Russian troops but across that simultaneously, the Palestinians need freedom. Uh, the, you know that the Palestinian unemployment and those who get jobs oftentimes have to wait hours at checkpoints. How discouraging it would be if every day you're going hours at a checkpoint to get to work and get home. As one is just that. But both people both people need what they need and they they could work it out. So the Palestinians it, need security too, and the Jews need freedom. They need freedom to be able to travel across borders, to go to to live their lives and not in fear. Yes, Ellen. Uh, no, I don't have a question. Oh, Victor. Victor Kolodziejko. I I agree with you on the two. Well, that's the way they feel. So, and they have a, everybody has a right to want security. And considering Jewish history, do you blame them for wanting security? No. So, yes, they, it, Israel has to be made secure. But, but the Palestinians can't bear the brunt of what happened to the Jews. Yeah. And it seems to me that we can eliminate some of this, uh, the, the checkpoints, uh, you know, the problem with the Palestinians having to struggle to get to work. If there were alternate uh, ways of earning a living so they didn't have to go through these checkpoints. And it seems to me that uh, Israel has set up a system that doesn't allow them to develop their own infrastructure. Am I right with that? Well, Israel certainly has put a high priority on helping the Palestinians get small business and develop like that. I mean, it would seem to me that basically what you've got is, uh, it's almost a form okay. of slavery or pro-laws or something. It's apartheid. I mean, yes. 
And un unless uh, unless the uh, it's opened up to the point where the Palestinians can can fend for themselves, and they don't have to go through this, and then the Israelis might be a little more open to negotiate. I agree. I got a question. I'm not a Janibus, uh geopolitical analyst extraordinaire. <laughs> oh. I, don't, I don't know how to uh, fix a car or anything like that, but I'm This specialty is available for my people I got for everything, and I give it to you free. I got the best one I'd like to ask my speaker because I'm sorry if I'm late. What if the United Nations, which uh, gave birth to Israel, says to Israel, like United Nations, we're going to move the United Nations to Jerusalem and make that the capital because 85% of the world's population is in the East Hemisphere, not in the West Hemisphere, first. And second, what if they demilitarize Israel, take everybody's guns, the Arabs, the atheists, the Jews, the Muslims, everybody, nobody has any guns except the United Nations peacekeeping forces to keep everybody protected and secure and demilitarize Israel. I think, would you agree to that solution? It's part of reality. How do you do it? How do you do it? Use the mic. The nations is the one that uh, created Israel. They're the ones who should do it. No, but, well, you know, well, let's propose it to him. <coughs> you know, I should bell the cat. All right. Use the mic, please. Use the mic. Uh, Use the, the mic. The gentleman Use the in the mic. back corner talked about a land grab. Jews lived in Hebron continuously for over 3,000 years until the Arab pogroms of the 1920s. Point to the land that you're talking about on anywhere on Earth except maybe Antarctica, which has not been grabbed. Yes. What is your example of land which has not been grabbed so we can contrast it with your, your rhetoric about land grabbing? Are you talking about... No, the, the fact is that the, my, my question is, how can anybody be, be crying for security security while enlarging their property? I mean, that just doesn't make any sense. Or standing on land, you're sitting, pardon me, or well, sitting on land America, which was grabbed, right, you're uh, not far from the graves of the people who were murdered in the land grab. The Indians. Why? Why is one land grab so different from the entire rest of the planet Earth? And mind you, I'm not even arguing when you call it a land grab. That's a separate argument. But but I'll, I'll skip over that. Where on Earth is land which has not been grabbed? <laughs> one civilization. Lithuania has never taken land from anybody. There's uh, loads of land that's not been taken by anybody. The They've been there for thousands of years. So who? You're telling me all, war, all wars are for aggression of land? <coughs> That's preposterous. <laughs> right. Dean Pappas. The yeah. of There's no opposition to this the United States protection. on our land grab. That's why we, we, we keep doing it. There's, no, there's nobody well, opposing us to this. It's for free. Let's, we have a guy with ideas and a, an attention <coughs> to a subject. And I ask you to direct your questions to him. All right. Uh, how much time do we have left? Um, right now it is exactly uh, 7.56. Maybe one or two more questions will go into rebuttals. Right. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Let's go to rebuttals. Rebuttals, then. Okay. All right. Uh, how many people... Willing to uh, expose their ignorance uh, uh, to the scorn of the more ignorant. One, two, three, four. Uh, that's all. No, there's more. Five. <laughs> well, David Travis. Go about five minutes. All right, let's take our speaker. All right. Thank you. Yeah, 
I will. Let me get the microphone, David. You want to get the microphone? Got to do things according to the rules, you know. Thank you. Uh, I would like to call to your attention uh, that some years ago, uh, I believe it was an American uh, Jewish family, uh, the girl was getting married, I think it was in the King David Hotel, and there was a, uh, uh, a Palestinian gentleman who worked in the hotel that had worked there for something like, I think, 10 years, and uh, he smuggled in a bomb, and while the marriage was taking place, and dancing and so on, the bomb went off, and it took the entire second floor out. Uh, uh, horrible, untold killing, damaging, uh, uh, and death because of, of that. Now, this is a man who was considered a, uh, a friendly to the to Israel, and he worked at, at the hotel and everything. The, the fact is that if you look and see how many Jews have thrown bombs at Palestinians over the years, you'll be hard pressed to come up with any. Yet many Palestinians strap explosives onto themselves go into a crowded uh, restaurant or other place and blow themselves up knowing that they're going to take out uh, uh, a dozen or more Jews. Uh, the Palestinians are taught a profound hatred of the Jews from the time they're babies. The Jewish people in Israel, they don't teach their children to hate the Palestinians. Uh, the Jews are very busy being industrious, developing themselves technologically, pursuing an education, and so forth, while the Palestinians look for ways to destroy Israel, whether it's a few Jews, many Jews, or whatever. Now, uh, the, the, if you ask why there can't be peace, the, the Jews will point to the Palestinians, and the Palestinians will point to the Jews. But the Jews have a credibility. They don't go around throwing bombs at innocent people, but the Palestinians do. So therefore, they lost their credibility. They are the ones that cause the problems, not the Jews. Thank you. Question. Question. If the Palestinians had access to bulldozers and tanks, do you think that that might level the playing field? Uh, no, it would only increase their, their uh, hostilities, their aggression against Israel. But they wouldn't have to use bombs, you know. They could just you know, stand their bulldozers up against the I don't think so. I think that the Palestinians have it in their guts to want to destroy the Jews. The Jews don't have that like that. So as long as the Jews are going to continue to build and, and have their lives and so on, they're always going to have to contend with the Palestinians. For a number of reasons. Well, the Palestinians feel that the Jews took their land away from them. The Jews say God gave them the land at the time when he made the covenant with Abraham. Uh, aside from that, aside from that, the United Nations 
gave, they made Israel a state by a UN mandate. The land was held by Great Britain. They had it. And they, well, wait a minute. Do you want me to answer your question? Great Britain took it away from the Turks, from the Ottoman Empire. Okay, if you've ever watched Lawrence of Arabia, this was the, 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 the destroying of the empire of the Ottomans. And then okay. England had it. Okay, so England. Time. England, uh, by persuasion from the United States, gave it back to Israel. Does that Next. answer your question? No. Next. Well, where did they? Oh, let me say that I think that it's less productive to have a debate from the floor. Let's get the next three butter up. If not, I'll go. Yeah, well, if you don't want to do that. go next. You're next. Okay. You're next. The man says I'm next. Five minutes. Space. About your piece. Yeah. <laughs> Ma'am, with all respect, you sound like an American. You have never dealt with an alien culture that is profoundly different from your own. And that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about several of them. It's like to grow up being a woman and not being able to vote. You may not understand what it's like growing up to be a Jew. You certainly do not understand what it's like growing up to be an Arab. Now, to my, my main points, I want to make two points. Um, kind of examples, and I'll have to be very quick, so uh, please excuse my, my abbreviations. One of the few things that's clear in the entire Middle East situation is that many of the parties behave very predictably. I'm not talking about what side somebody's on, and I'm not talking about good guy, bad guy, like, don't like. I'm talking about do you know what they're going to do? And in a lot of cases, yes, you know what they're going to do. Hamas is very, very predictable. Hamas is going to antagonize Israel until the crude goes into Gaza yet again and smashes things up. That's what Hamas does. It's predictable. You know that's what they do. Hamas was elected by the people of Gaza. This absurd catastrophe most recently, a few months ago, of trashing yet more of Gaza. The people of Gaza voted for that. I do not pretend to understand, but those are the facts on the ground. And I have no clue how to deal with that or with them. Um, and I was hoping to get a clue tonight or a suggestion, and I am sorely disappointed. Uh, I assume that most people here know the word zealot. Possibly a few know the, the Navy Sakari. Uh, the Zealots originally, the origin of the word, the Zealots were a faction in the Jew, uh, amongst the Jews 2,000 years ago. In the time of the Romans, there were a variety of major divisions of Judaism. The Zealots were so intense that they were a large factor in provoking the rebellion against the Romans, which destroyed Palestine. When the Romans besieged Jerusalem in uh, I was 68, 67, 68 AD, um, the city had enough supplies inside the city walls to last a siege of 20 years. And the political factions inside the city were so intense that when one faction got the upper hand, they would burn down the warehouses of the other faction and the city fell in two years. Those are the zealots. And today we have zealots again. The West Bank, the, the, the so-called price taggers on the West Bank um, are now, as far as I can tell, indistinguishable from the Ku Klux Klan. And I do not mean the, the entire population, the Israeli population of the West Bank, I do not mean all the settlers, but I mean the dangerous and organized and active extremists uh, I, I, have, I, I keep looking for a difference between them and the Klan, and I, I have more and more trouble finding it. There's a kind of a Roman dagger called the Sicarius, and there were characters 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem who called themselves Sicarii, 
because they carried daggers. The daggers were in case they would run into someone violating a commandment, they could murder them on the spot. And today in Jerusalem, there are Jewish nutcases calling themselves Sikari. So far, all they do is things like burn down ice cream parlors because the lasciviousness of ice cream is sinful. And I am not making any of this up, that there's an ice cream parlor that's been burned down three or four times because men and women are both allowed to buy ice cream there. These are the kinds of loonies, loonies on both sides. The two sides are the loonies who want to kill and the people who want to live in peace. I was hoping tonight for something new or interesting, and um, I've been disappointed. Okay. Don, go ahead. There's a script up here. Is, is, this, is this yours, sir? Yeah. Okay. Um, there you go. Um, all right. Well, this is, uh, yeah, I'm sorry I came late. I uh, actually I was going to stay home tonight, and a friend of mine called me up on the phone, and, and he said, hey, Don, are you going to the college? And I said, oh, I don't know. I got a lot of work to do. Well, they're talking about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I said, okay, I'm going. <laughs> and... Uh, Anyway, um, I, I thought this was very interesting. Oh, here's your map. And um, one of the things that I, I would have to take issue with a few of that, I think it's good that you're thinking about these things because, you know, the, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is really, it's, it's, it's really kind of, in a lot of ways, at the heart of the whole Middle Eastern conflict. So, for, you know, on the, on the one side, you know, you have you have Israel, and most of the the United States and most of the other Western nations tend to sympathize with Israel as fellow Westerners. And on the on on the other side is the Palestinian side, and most Arabs and frankly most of the Arab countries tend to sympathize more with the Palestinians. So it really the, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict really is to to, to, to the, the it, it, it really is like a whole microcosm of the whole conflict between, between the West and, and the Middle East. Um, and, and it's also a kind of a flashpoint that leads to this, this thing. It was one of the reasons that Bin Laden gave for, um, for declaring war on the United States. Um, now, there's, I, I'd have to, so I, I'm glad that, that we're having this, this, this um, lecture, and I'm glad that, you know, you're, you're, trying to do something. I think the more people that are trying to do something, I mean, I may be old-fashioned, but I believe that peace is preferable to war. I believe that love is preferable to hate, and and most radical of all, I believe that forgiveness is preferable to revenge. So, um, so, so I'm glad to see somebody's doing something about this, because unfortunately, you know, the situation really, as Neil was saying, it really looks intractable. But one of the, I would have to take issue with a few things you were saying. First of all, they, the people who are not Ashkenazi Jews are not second class citizens in the sense that, that black people living in the South were um, officially. As my understanding is that uh, all Israeli citizens, regardless of, um, regardless of, of, of religion or where their ancestors came from, have equal rights. So the, the, that being the case, uh, there is discrimination. I've been reading about this. I've been doing some research on my own on this. Uh, there is discrimination um, against against the Arabs, and to some extent within the Jewish community, against the um, there is uh, some discrimination against the Sephardic Jews. Um, one of one of the biggest problems that with one of the biggest obstacles um, to to peace in 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 Israel is. I think the intransigence of people on the majority of both sides. Now, not just of the Palestinian side, but also on the Israeli side too. Um, if just just now, the um, uh, the Israeli the Israeli voters just voted in a new election, um, and Likud won a plurality, and so they're going to form a new coalition. Likud, of course, um, opposes a independent Palestinian state, or at least. Benjamin Netanyahu definitely does. I read his book, Fighting Terrorism. Um, I would recommend it to anyone to 
get the um, to to get his take on it, and uh, and and he actually rejects the idea. He says it can never happen. Now, um, on the on the on the Hamas on the Palestinian side, I think somebody Neil I think already mentioned this. It wasn't just the Gaza Strip where Hamas won a majority of the votes. There was there was Palis there was elections throughout the Palestinian areas in, in both the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And Hamas actually won the elections. They won a majority in the Palestinian parliament. Now, and, 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 and they actually they actually consider the, the, Pal the Palestinian state an illegitimate state. And at that point, at that time, they refused to negotiate with Israel. So, so they also are uh, intransigent. So basically, this means that this means that the majority of both sides in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict support the rejectionist side, rejecting the right to statehood of the other side. Uh, one thing they, one thing they both agree on, and and now the reason that that the the, the so-called Palestinian Authority, led by Fatah and, and its president Mahmoud Abbas, is still internationally recognized as the leader of the Palestinians, is because when Hamas won the elections, the the U.S. government and the Israeli government both announced that they would never recognize a government led by Hamas. Um, and, and they urged they urged the Palestinian they urged Abbas to nullify the elections, which he did, and that's why he's still recognized as the uh, as the internet as the leader of the Palestinians. But the majority of Palestinians consider him illegitimate. And now that Hamas has a second government, which they claim is the sole legitimate one for the Palestinians. All right. This whole thing about war can be solved with one fell swoop. The reason why I believe the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has gone on for so long is because both sides really want to be at war. It benefits the status quo to have a common enemy rather than to look inside themselves to solve their own internal problems. If we look at Russia today, one of the main reasons why Putin is doing what he's doing in the Ukraine, quote unquote, for Mother Russia, is because he's having a lot of trouble dealing with his own internal strife and the non-delivery of certain economic promises. In Israel itself, yes, there's a lot of so-called prosperity going on right there, but at what expense? And a lot of American dollars being spent. Why is the Middle East having so much trouble right now? It's because a lot of the emphasis that's on the current political, geopolitical landscape where the Muslims are, it's centered in uh, Saudi Arabia, not where it was in Turkey a few number of years ago. What I see happening myself over the next 30 to 50 years is that uh, as we get more internet access, as these kids grow up, it's going to be much like it was with Oliver Twist in England. Oliver Twist has come to town and he's got a cell phone. What will happen is they'll see how the West lives. Why can't we be like this? And they'll start realizing that their leadership is not what they want. Right now with the Arab Spring, reminds me a lot of our 1960s with our you know not only the free love but the protests and the riots and everything else and it eventually sorted itself out through movements through various things we eventually won the war in vietnam why do i say we won it we yes we did because look at look at vietnam now it is a capitalist paradise corporations go in they have cheap labor and they're generally now, you can walk into Vietnam as an American soldier, talk with the very compatriots that were shooting against you 30 to 40 years ago. Yeah, 
I honestly think we won the Vietnam War. The biggest problem with the Arab-Israeli thing is much like what happened with the Shining Path in Peru. No real clear access to land or title of that land and no real monetization or being able to get a value or a mortgage on that land for you know starting a business if you if you don't own your home and you have a home here in the states you got a way to mortgage it to get a business running you can't do that in israel you can't do that in egypt it's all called debt capital what is it going to take simple a willingness to go back to the rule of law a willingness to recognize common land and common borders and common land title and a simple reflection back to the rule of law and a respect for a comprehensive court system. A big thing you say? No, it's not. Japan did it after World War II under the MacArthur Plan. Many Europe, after many years of bloody conflict, came into being with the European Economic Community. And it's time now that these Arab-Israeli conflicts go under some form of common common governance in the Arab world. Once the oil runs out of Saudi Arabia and the center of the Muslim culture goes back to Turkey, you're going to see Turkey rise, rise quickly, and you're going to see a lot more peace in the Middle East. Thank you. No, I didn't say that, Charlie. A lot more than that. No, no. Excuse me, please. Is there a Steve Caronios here? Is there a Steve Caronios here? Okay. Next. Well, this has been a very interesting night. I think if I'm going to rebut, I'm going to rebut more of the rebutters than uh, <laughs> than our speaker, who I think had some, some great ideas. Um, I'm going to start with the most recent, which is Tim. Uh, I Actually, I agree with Tim that uh, often conflict is the best thing for a government in power. Whenever there's fear and conflict, uh, it gives leaders who are in power uh, an edge to, to stay in power. I'm not sure that that's the main elements in uh, uh, Israel and Palestine, but it is in many other places, probably including here in the United States. Fear is a primary tool used by politicians. I would disagree with Tim on Vietnam as far as Viet. First of all, I don't think we've won the war there. I think we, we left with our tail between our legs. And uh, it is not a capitalist paradise at this point. <laughs> Vietnam is still one of the poorest nations of the world. I think Bangladesh is lower. Myanmar is a little lower in terms of per capita income. But uh, they're way, way down near the bottom. They're not doing well because they are holding on very strongly to their uh, uh, communist uh, ideology. But and you've got a McDonald's nothing. there. Well, oh, there's, there's a start. God knows. Maybe, you know, over time. But I don't know if Bangladesh or Myanmar have McDonald's. We'll have to get them to work on it, too. Um, I agree with Neil that on the notion that uh, almost all the land in the world that we live, anyone lives in today, especially the industrialized nations, uh, was a land grab at one time or another of one sort or another. Uh, one of the differences, however, with the with the, quotes, land grab in Israel is that it is much more recent, for one thing, within the living memory of many, many people today. And number two, it's in an age of uh, communications, electronic communications, universal communications, TV, movies, internet, radio, etc., etc. Everybody knows what's going on there. They see the pictures. They hear about it on a daily basis. And uh, the people who, who win the hearts and minds of the most people in the world are going to have a substantial advantage in this case. Uh, I think in, in this case, right now, the Palestinians have an edge because they are kind of the underdogs, and there's a tendency for all of us to, to favor uh, the underdogs. 
Now, in terms of military force and power, the Israelis have the advantage, and they also have the major political advantage of having the U.S. as an ally uh, for a variety of reasons, and um, APAC is one of those major reasons, but nonetheless it is the reality, and it will probably be the reality for a while, that Israel will have the advantage of uh, U.S. alliance. Uh, the recent Israeli elections did uh, put the right-wingers, especially the Likud, back into power, but not, not by a huge, huge margin. The elections were fairly close, which suggests that there are a lot of Israelis who really would prefer a peaceful solution. Now, on the other hand, to those who are worried about the Palestinians, uh, the Palestinian elections in general have shown that the Palestinians uh, really are, are not happy with any kind of a peace deal. Uh, and again, it's because they think their land was stolen. So, so there is a, a, a psychological uh, gap uh, there. Uh, unfortunately, now I, I, we, I think we should all support people like Howard and uh, the people who are trying to do the things he's trying to do to come up with peaceful solutions because peace is always a, uh, a better way to end things. But I'm afraid that this will end uh, in the long run the way many of these conflicts do and that is power and force will ultimately prevail uh, military power, economic power, and political power. But this is a case that's going to go on for years. We saw what happened in Ireland. Uh, now we're in a period of temporary peace in Northern Ireland. And I, I'm, I'm I, you know, I say temporary peace. I'm not a pessimist. I'm not an optimist there. I think that that may not last, although it may. We can hope it will last after 600 years. So we don't know uh, how long this uh, situation will go on in Israel and Palestine. Thank you. As, a, as I've said before, I'm Eris Yanabas, born uh, south of Athens, north of Sparta. But in my Greek, I don't know, I probably got 25 different kinds of nationalities of blood in me. Like probably half Turkish and half Albanian. So. The thing is, as uh, let's say, uh, since born in Greece, I have a certain attitude that a lot of Greeks have, that there are two uh, world views out there. Actually, I learned this from Greeks in the coffee house. I never learned this in college or from my parents. That uh, Judaism is uh, totalitarian. If you look at the Bible, there's only one God. We had, the Greeks have 12 gods. So if uh, Greek, you know, if Israel is a holy land, I was born in a holier land. They have one God, I got 12 gods. So I'm holier than thou. <laughs> That's the other thing. The other thing is, good friend, Mr. Quarry, I wish I heard him, but I was tied up somewhere else. You know, the other thing is that uh, I admire Jews who have a lot of chutzpah, you know. A lot of piss and vinegar, a lot of, you know, come out with how they feel. And I had the privilege, about 40 years ago, over here at Mather High School, it was a packed house, a couple thousand people on the auditorium. Meyer Kahani came over there. I mean, I, I didn't, it wasn't until after I was 65 when I read the Bible and stuff like that that I started uh, becoming more Jewish oriented. And I could say now I'm probably one of the greatest Jewologists in the West Hemisphere. Oh, I don't know yeah. about the East Hemisphere, but in the West Hemisphere, I'm the most prominent Jewologist that I know. Maybe more than these Jewish guys, I don't know. But I have to have 25 hours to analyze the issues with them. But uh, now Meyer Kahani, I read a book of his. I, I'm, I was so stupid 40 years ago. It's a good thing I grew up older so I wouldn't die stupid. At least I learned a few things. And I wish I bought that book at the Mather High School because that book was really profound and it was based on the promise of the Bible. That in the Bible, which I read, by the way, it took me five years, I read a half a page at a time, God promised to the Jews not this little sliver of land here, Israel, He promised the Jews from the river to the river. And it's five, ten places in the Bible. And this is what Meyer Kahani's book was about. I wish I could find it. 
Uh, I did find a book of his in the library, Uncomfortable Questions for Comfortable Jews. And the gist of that is, in about 20 different places, he says, we cannot accept Hellenism. He doesn't mean the Greeks, you know, we're small potatoes in the world scene. But he means the ideology of Hellenism because it's based on uh, acceptance of everybody as equal and democracy. He, and Meyer Kahani eloquently argues, he says, if we accept that, then we're going to be outnumbered. There's 200 million Arabs and Muslims over there, and we're only about five, six million. So he says, we cannot accept democracy and equal rights in, in the Middle East. And um, I read one book by a British author. I can't remember his name, but he writes in there about the uh, Israeli flag. See, when you look at the Israeli flag, maybe all you guys don't know that, but maybe Jewish people know it. You look up, up here is a blue, and down here is the blue. You see, what? Well, you know, the Greek flag has a lot of blue in it too. You know, a lot of flags have it. white and blue. There's blue everywhere. But in the Jewish flag, in the uh, Israeli flag rather, the blue on the top and the blue on the bottom means if you turn it, see, if you look at it vertically, one is on top and one is on bottom. But the meaning is you put it like this horizontally and it's from blue here to blue here. So in effect, Bullshit. It's a talus. It's a prayer shawl. Well, the way this British author, I wish I could remember his name, he said it means from the river to the river. So in other words, my Meyer Kahani, one of my Jewish heroes, which somebody killed, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago, he killed him, I think, in New York. He was a member of the Knesset, too. He was an eloquent man, and he was honest. Now, that man, I wish he was here tonight. Good. All right. Next reporter, please. Next reporter, we, we got an open mic. All right, Rob. I remember Stuyvesant High School in Manhattan on East 15th Street. Just down the street from the Friends Meeting, where I, I later went. <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, it was about 85% Jewish, and we got all the Jewish holidays, and I really enjoyed having the Jewish holidays, the Christian holidays, and uh, any secular holidays that we could get. But uh, it was, uh, some of my fellow students were, uh, Zionists, uh, and uh, but most of my uh, friends, uh, fellow uh, students, were not. Uh, though they were Jewish, all right, uh, and they were a little doubtful. They, 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 they were sort of pro-Israel, but they were not committed to Zionism per se. Uh, many were uh, of a socialistic uh, background uh, as far as their uh, political thinking, their family's political thinking went. Uh, and I, I learned a lot. Uh, for one thing, we had uh, about uh, five uh, political parties on the New York City uh, ballot. Uh, the Liberal Party, the Fusion Party, the uh, Progressive Party, the Democratic Party, uh, the Republican Party, uh, later we got a Conservative Party. Uh, well, at any rate, uh, there, were, there were parties, and there were tendencies, and there, there was politics galore. But, what about <coughs> Israel? Uh, well, some uh, young people thought, oh yes, I'll go over to Israel and be a kibbutznik. Uh, uh, I'll uh, uh, fight for uh, 
Israel against all the, the uh, enemies and so on. And they had enemies. Of course, the, the Arabs uh, who uh, had been the major uh, the population of uh, Palestine and, and uh, other people in Palestine were not all too happy uh, with the uh, the influx of uh, mostly European Jews and later uh, the Sephardic Jews and uh, it, but that's what it comes down to is that you still have to make peace it's our commitment whether from Judaism, Christianity, or Islam. Making peace is what, what God commands, what God wants. And it's God's land, not the land of the Jews, or the Muslims, or the Christians. It's God's land. And the Jews, Muslims, and Christians, the question is, are they going to be God's people? Are they going to be the peacemakers? So, making peace is an art and a science and a commitment. And I think a religion. Uh, I've, I went to the Quaker meeting on East 15th Street, too, for several years. I taught first day school. <laughs> well, I, and I saw how people can get together and can overcome all sorts of differences. You know, just look in yourself and your family. You're fighting with yourself and you're fighting with your family. But you do make peace, you look for peace, you, you pray for it, okay? <laughs> Next up on Earth. Okay, uh, great speech today for peace. Peace is very, very nice. God, I don't know, God wants peace, but also God is uh, always on our side, so God must want war too sometimes. Uh, oil hasn't been spoken about too much. The Middle East has a little bit of oil, and maybe Israel is doing something about that. Um, some people say that Israel could be the 51st state of the United States. Um, it certainly seems that way. The peace of Israel will come when people are become tired of fighting each other. And maybe when Israel runs out of money to um, buy all the arms from the United States. Thank you. All right. I'll take a shot at this. <laughs> all right, let's thank our speaker. It's been a lot of time and effort on this and many years of doing it. I must confess, this is not a topic that I <coughs> pursue assiduously, but that doesn't uh, preclude me or uh, from commenting here this evening. I'm trying to think of the other term. Disqualifies me, that's it. Considering what I've what I've done thus far, I only want to make a few brief observations regarding this. Uh, uh, are you entitled to 
to land or not. I mean, granted, a great deal of the history of the world and the history of the United States is the history of real estate. Um, I'm much more familiar with the situation in Tibet with the Chinese, and there seems to be some dispute whether or not Tibet is Tibetan or Tibet is Chinese. And you can get a cup of coffee and probably go either way on any of these issues. That one is just an example. I did hear something here regarding uh, the one culture is is benign and the other one is militaristic and hostile. Those types of things have no validity whatsoever anywhere under any context to start assessing cultures or ethnic groups and saying they are this or they are that. They are comprised of a multitude of people over a multiple periods of time. And no, there's no such thing. I think you, for example, you could have a counterexample if you looked into the cultures of uh, any of these. So I'm, that's not even worth pursuing. The thing that is worth pursuing is a little bit that I do know about is when there's, there seems to be some issue of conventional warfare and unconventional warfare. And um, I'm not precisely certain from a historical point of view what the distinction is. If we in the West generally think that uniform personnel um, will engage in combat with other unified personnel. That has almost never been the case anywhere. And there's been all sorts of insurgents, underground movements, things of that nature that all constitute warfare. And you're not going to differentiate among the things. Um, Yes, entering, I've also heard it heard here at the college, if third world countries do not engage it, well, they actually fight third world wars, meaning third world in that sense. Uh, that's why there's, there's no rule book on this. And to try to impose it on this is not going to work. And, it's, and to say, well, our sort of warfare is, is authorized. And, you know, these justifications, I'm sorry, I'm not going to pay any attention to them. You know, it's like the United States. This case, in how many wars since World War II? 125? Yes, all with total appropriate. Do you know that every war Every war that the Roman Empire engaged in from when it was Rome itself was a stoic war for self-defense. Right. I mean, you can play these, these games in your mind, and then I guess it enables you to do certain things. It gives justification, or you tell this to your troops, and they believe it, and at the end of the day, that's not the case. So we've got to look at this very carefully. Now, this is a topic I have not researched, but it did came up here, and I'd have to look into this, but yeah, I'm not researched this at all, and I don't even want to get research in it, but these things are mentioned terrorists, these people that blow people up, and it seems kind of, why didn't they occur to them that you're inflicting warfare against non-combatants, innocent people, that doesn't seem to be justified. Yet, in their minds, it is justified. Now, the thing that threw me about this was, I was under the impression that a terrorist who puts dynamite on themselves were like people who 
had grown up under hostile conditions or in a camp and had no outlook towards the future when that, in fact, I was corrected by someone who pointed me out literature that the people who do this are, in fact, the college graduates and the people who, in fact, seemingly have a future. Yet, they seek to do this, which is unethical from every perspective, yet, in their minds, it is. Not only ethical, it, well, you could go on and on in this. So, it, it's sad that the situation certainly exists. Let's bring it into it, you know. But then again, to any kind of this and that kind of stuff has got to go away in order to start the process. Anyhow, thank you very much, Howard. First of all, I'm against terrorism. Uh, however, uh, when, when Dave Travis was talking about the King David bombing, uh, the bombing of the King David Hotel, I thought he was talking about the one in 1946, which was actually carried out by an Israeli guerrilla army called the Irgun, uh, when, when Israel was fighting for its independence from the British. Uh, now, the Irgun used terrorist tactics. They took hostages. They, they, they bombed. Uh, uh, they did bombings, um, all kinds of stuff like that. So, and and currently there are terror, there are Jewish terrorist groups inside Israel, like like Kahana Chai and Kak, that carry out terrorist attacks on Palestinians. So there's actually terrorism on both sides. All right, very good. Let's play nice. Let's play nice. We all can right. Agree to disagree. I got two. Right. I got. All right, you're on. What? Well, Speaker like gets the last word. No, I wanted to say everybody because this is my life's work, and hearing these different opinions and hearing where I didn't succeed is important to me. So all I want to say now, I doubt if I'll see any of you anymore, maybe, but it's unlikely. Um, just, if you want to remember me, just remember a couple things. One, I believe in the concept of looking at all the alternatives before decision making and important decisions and not jumping to conclusions early and not sticking with them. Secondly, I hope we all realize that we are influenced by the American media. And I think it's important that we all do our independent analysis. And the main thing is this. Um, earlier in my life, I was more passive. Now, at the end of my life, I'm trying to be active. I'm trying to not just listen to about things and analyze things. I'm trying to do things. So what I want to say, ask you is, start or increase whatever you try to do things. Let's do things to help solve this problem. And there are things you can do. You can be open-minded. You can be looking for all the alternatives. You can be studying. You can you can lobby politicians. But let's not let the, the big deals of the world win out. Let's let the grassroots have some say in it. And that that's what I'm trying to do. I'm going to keep trying to do it. And um, I'm glad I had this chance to talk and to listen to you guys and gals tonight. Thank you.